I thank you for coming. I'd like to welcome you all to the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship. Those of you who are out there joining us online, it's a blessing to have you with us today. I'd like to have you turn in your Bibles, please, if you have them, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 will be our text that we're going to be using today. And I would like to say, as we get started, to you singles out there, singles in here, singles online, whether single not married, whether single having, be, having been married, you will do a great disservice to yourself today by tuning me out. This message is a very important message for every man, for every lady, for every young person here today. Some of you young people, some of you listening online, even, even as teens, would save yourself some gigantic problems later in your life if you would lean and glean from our message today. Uh, we've been talking about love languages the past few weeks. The past uh, three services, we started our family series. Today we're going to be talking something about a little differently than uh, the language of love. Today's message is titled, The Number One Enemy of Love. The Number One Enemy of Love. I've thought about it and uh, thought I think that there perhaps might be something else that could be equally as um, an enemy of love as this one. But nonetheless, I do believe that this is right at the top of, of um, things that are against love. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to begin reading, uh, reading in verse 25 through 27. And then we'll be skipping down to verses 29 through 32. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 25, it says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath, I would like you to think of that also as the word rage. Let all bitterness and wrath or rage and anger and clamor, which is fighting. And evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And shall we pray? Lord God, I thank Thee for sparing our lives on this side of eternity another day and for allowing us to be able to have some people with us here uh, for church this afternoon as well as those who are joining us here online. I pray, Lord, that this will be a, a service that will get a hold of their hearts and attention, that they will gain some good insights into their lives and their relationships as a result of this message. I pray that they will be attent as I speak and preach. I pray that you will be with me and give me the words that you want me to say. Just please be with us this afternoon for our service, Lord. Hide us now behind the cross and fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost of God as I bring this service today. In Jesus' name we pray and just for his sake. Amen. There is a major destroyer of love today. It is on the loose. I believe it ranks at the top, if not the top, with the leading cause of divorce. I believe it is the greatest thief that draws love out of people's lives. I believe that it affects married and single people alike. And that destroyer is unresolved anger. Unresolved anger. We're going to be dealing with anger today. And I, I said that it might be another destroyer. I believe it perhaps might be a tie, and the other one being the breaking of trust. When trust is broken, a marriage is well nigh in big trouble. But I suggest to you today that one of the leading destroyer of marriages, and not just marriages, but relationships of all types, is unresolved anger. I'm not talking about that anger that just keeps you awake at night, uh, gnawing at your stomach, that fight that you've had with your boyfriend, that fight that you've had with your spouse and you went to bed angry. I'm not just talking about that, but I'm talking about that gnawing anger that has seems to have disappeared in our life. 
But I would like to tell to you that, uh, say to you that today that when anger uh, supposedly disappears in our life, it's not really disappearing, it is just getting buried inside. And when you bury anger inside of your heart and in your life, it doesn't get buried, it is not dead inside of you, it lives inside of you. And it can create incredible problems for our lives. I once talked with a pastor, he was pastor of Shiloh Hill Baptist Church down in Atlanta, Georgia. They had Shiloh Hills Christian School. They had a policy there at the school that whenever someone was behind in their school bill that they would withhold the report cards. It was a little way that they had come up with to help keep um, you know, accounts current. He was telling me this one day in particular where he got a call from the school secretary and said, Pastor, you've got to get down here. We have a problem. And he said, what's the matter? And she said, uh, so-and-so, and, -so, and um, we'll just uh, we'll, we'll change his name. We'll call his name Jack. Jack so-and-so uh, is down here, and he's very angry because we haven't issued the report cards for his kids. And, and the pastor said, well, why didn't you? And they said, well, because the school bill hasn't been paid. And, and the pastor said, well, did you tell him that? And she said, we did. We told him that. But he's gone nuts down here, and he's telling us that we better get out of here or he's going to blow these buildings up. And the pastor said, well, I really don't think he means it, but perhaps I better get involved. And he said he did get involved, and he got down there, and he found this man, a keg full of, a powder keg full of anger. He was angry, he was volatile, he was threatening. The problem was, he had had a difference with a man, a man in the church over a home that was built. And they had not resolved all the differences in the way that he had wanted them resolved. And he was still angry. And, and, and he had buried that anger inside. And now it was just exploding. As, you know, the, the slightest thing sent him off. In this case, they didn't get the report cards. And the anger was just exploding all over the place. Anytime anyone would get around him, you didn't know when it, uh, when it was going to erupt, when it was going to explode, and it was possessing his life and erupting at every turn. Some of you listening are saying, come on, preacher, why didn't you just tell him to get over it? Just come on, just get over it. Well, some of you listening out there, or maybe in here, maybe you are able to get over it. But even if you are, I'll tell you that this message is still for you. Because even if you are not carrying anger in your life, there is a very good chance that you have caused anger in somebody else's life. Angry people tend to get very angry at people who aren't very angry. And you might have very well caused anger in someone else's life. But perhaps maybe some of you would be saying, I know exactly how that man felt because I deal with anger in my life today. We're going to look at some of those issues. For many, perhaps, listening today, it is hard for you to get over things that have happened in your life, things that have happened badly for you, things that didn't work, a, work their way out the way that you wanted, and that sneaky damage continues to have its effect on your life. When you harbor anger, it's kind of, you know, if you think about it, it's kind of like a car rusting. If you've ever seen a car rust, I mean, that car is new and it looks great, but then all of a sudden you start to see a little bit of rust under that paint. And sooner or later it spreads and it spreads and it spreads. And you try to work on that. And you go out there and you sand it all down. You get it looking clear. You fill that in, that body filler, and you start painting again. And what happens? It, start rust, it starts to rust again. And that rust just doesn't stop. It will rust and continue to rust forever. That rust is like a cancer in that car. And anger is like a cancer in our lives, just like that car rusting. And anger and hatred and bitterness, they're like a cancer that destroys the vessel that they're kept in. If you keep angry in your life, listen to me, if you keep anger unresolved in your life, it will absolutely destroy you. Some of you may be saying, not me, preacher. I'm a happy camper. Some of you may think you're a happy camper, but you still may have some anger uh, buried down inside. We're going to take a look and consider this today. I have found through the years and through uh, my studies that anger seems to spring from three separate emotions. Anger will primarily come from three separate emotions. It can come from just maybe one of those, or perhaps two of them together, or perhaps all three. Uh, by the way, anger in itself is an emotion. By the way, anger by itself does not necessarily have to be bad. 
It is possible to be angry and have it not be sin. That is why our scripture says, Be ye angry and what? Sin not. In other words, it is possible for you to have anger controlled in your life and have it not be sin. By the way, I think there are some things that we should get angry about, don't you? I think that when the government comes and says that my children cannot go to school unless they have their vaccinations, but I believe that vaccinations are contrary to the Word of God, I believe that I have a right to get upset about that. Either I'm going to back down to the will of the government, or I'm going to compromise my views on God, and I shouldn't have to do that. And that is something that we should get upset about. I believe that when the government comes and dictates to us the kind of people that we have to to allow to be members in our church and um, not discriminate in places we can put them in places of ministry when they have uh, sexual lifestyles that are contrary to the word of God. I believe that the government saying that we have to allow that into the church and we have to accept that, which by the way, I'm not going to say that someone who has a sexual lifestyle that is contrary to the word of God is not welcome in our church. By all means, come to our church. Listen to us online. I'll be happy to talk with you. But at the same time, I am not going to compromise the word of God because you have sin in your life that is unconfessed. It is my job as the pastor, as the preacher, to share with you about that sin. So that why? So that you know you have that need of a Savior. And if the government says that I am not allowed to do that, I believe that I have the right to get upset about that. That is called righteous indignation. Righteous indignation. But listen to me, there's a difference between anger being under control and being out of control in our lives. We go back to that verse where it says, uh, it gives us a little lead on how you can know it. It says, uh, uh, going back up here to uh, verse 26, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. It says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What it's talking about is that that anger is unresolved. I believe that there are people, even people who are angry about righteous things and things that the government has done or people have done that they are angry about. But that anger begins, to, even that righteous anger can begin to consume them. It can begin to control them. And you know them when you meet them. Because whenever you see them, that's all they talk about is this subject. This, 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 this. I'm angry about vaccines. Or, or it can be anything. It can be anything in the news that is going right now. You turn off Facebook and everyone's this, 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 this. The same post, the same things over and over again. And even if their cause is justified, even if their cause is something that is worth fighting for, that anger has taken control of them and is consuming them in their lives. It says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. We get angry. We need to unload that anger and not keep it. For married couples, I would say that if you are fighting with your spouse and you do not have that situation, that argument resolved before you go to bed, not to go to bed. Why? Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. When you keep anger, you keep it bottled up inside of you. The next verse says exactly what happens. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Now you've given place to the devil. You've given place to Satan in your life to be able to use that bottle-up anger, that pent-up anger, and it becomes a gigantic problem. Anger can be good. It can motivate us to stand up against injustice. But after anger motivates us to do good, we have to get rid of it. We have to get that anger out of our lives or else it will obsess us. It will possess us. I mentioned that anger is a secondary emotion. It comes from three primary emotional responses. The first of these responses is fear, the second frustration, and the third hurt. You will find when you examine anger in your life that it has come for one or two or even all three of these, from fear, from frustration, or from hurt. Some of us today get angry out of fear because they don't want someone to hurt us or do something wrong to us. I can give you an illustration about a couple. Say there's a married couple. And that man, he's getting ready to come home. And he says, every time I come home, my wife is standing there with her hands on her hips, and she's tapping her foot, and she's mad, and she just bites my head off. And I'm sick of it. I'm sick and come home. And, and this time, when I come home today, I'm going to get out of her for it. That woman says... 
My husband, every time he comes home, he is mean as a snake. And he comes in just yelling. And you know what? I'm tired of that. And when he comes home, I'm going to get in the first blow. You know what they're doing? They're carrying anger out of fear. Fear of being rejected, fear of being hurt, fear of being jumped upon, fear of uh, being treated wrongly, and because of that, anger seethes in that relationship. We think of frustration, frustration of those unfulfilled expectations in our life, where we're not getting what we expected to receive or thought that we should receive or not getting what we wanted. And anger, uh, and anger comes about because of those frustrations in our life. And the last is hurt. Hurt is the outcome of not getting what we expected, and as a result of that, we get angry. I want to say something to you. And look here, folks. Look here. Anger is our choice. Anger is our choice. If you are angry today, it's because you are choosing to be angry. You say, no, preacher, I don't want to be angry. I want to get rid of it. No, if you want to get rid of it, then get rid of it. Anger is our choice. If you are angry and you're seething in anger, it's because you are choosing to be angry. When you keep it bottled up inside of you, holding or letting it go is our choice. And maybe today... If I could show you, if we could just take a look at some things today, just for a few moments, the damage that can be caused in our lives as a result of unresolved anger. Maybe, maybe today, some of you in here or some of you listening online would, uh, would, would see that and today see that need and say, today the Lord has convicted me. Today I'm going to deal with anger in my life. I would like you to think of anger for a moment as a poison. I remember I had a friend back in school. I, I can't remember if it was high school or middle school. I think he was in, uh, in eighth grade, he was telling me the story. But uh, his parents were home, and he'd gone out to, uh, gone out to the, the garage, and he had found some weed killer out there. And it was this weed killer, and you, you mix up a batch and put the sprayer on it, and then you go out and you spray some weeds. And he had, they had some weeds in the yard, and he was out spraying them. Well, he had a bunch of weed killer left over. And there's a lot of pressure in there. And so he just like went around the yard and wrote words and wrote his name in the yard. And you know, as a result, you know, in a few days, you could see everything he had written in that yard. And you could see that, that spot was bare for another several months because of everywhere that, that, of that poison had sprayed. And if you could take a look at anger today, uh, think about a poison in your life. Maybe I could get you to think of anger as a, as a horrible poison put in the canister of your life and your body. And it's put in there and it's pressed in there and compacted in there and compressed in there. And then you put a sprayer on it and you're so full of anger. And then just you're, you're going on in life and something happens and all of a sudden you begin to spray that anger. You get something triggers it and you spray it all, all around and all over everybody and you spray that poison. And I want you to see today the consequences of what anger does every time something happens to pop that pressure cap and you start to spray anger all over everybody in your life. It comes in different sizes, different compression, different types of poison. And it depends on how long we've had it and how how much we have as to how poisonous it is and how frequently it gets sprayed all over everybody. What happens here? Angry people spray their anger on others. Moms and dads listening to me online, there's a chain today that needs to be broken in your life if you're a person carrying unresolved anger. Because you see, if you spray anger on your children long enough and often enough, they will grow up to be full of what? The very anger that you sprayed upon them. They will grow up to be full of anger. They will be full of unresolved anger. They will grow up to be angry adults. They will grow up to be the very thing that they couldn't stand upon you because all through their life you just kept pouring it in them. Angry people are like skunks. 
skunks walk around and they think that anytime anyone gets around them that they're gonna that they're gonna be hurt or something's gonna happen and so they spray all over them and they're paranoid about everything angry people are that way they get so paranoid and so uh, so afraid of getting hurt and getting rejected that every time someone comes around them that anger starts to spray all over them sooner or later if you get sprayed enough with anger you become a carrier of anger it goes from parents to kids but it also goes to hu from husbands to wives boyfriends to girlfriends and friends to friends I have known personally several couples in my life that I have grown up in, with them and saw them get married and saw them live together and saw their relationship and their marriages fall apart. And if I were to be able to get them up here today, they would be able to stand here and say, don't just get married because you don't want to be lonely. Don't settle for less than what God has in his best for you. Don't settle for less than what God has best for you. Angry people, couples keep spraying it onto each other's lives until both of them have unresolved anger in their life. I'd like to tell you a little illustration. Uh, this happened. There was a, a company that uh, liked to do things for, for inmates, for inmates in prison. And so it came up on Mother's Day and had the idea, maybe we could contact a card company and maybe they could donate some cards for the inmates in prison they could send out to their moms for Mother's Day. So they contacted a card company. The card company said, this sounds like a great idea. And they donated it. They don't have cards for all of the inmates in prison. And they brought the cards and they said, hey, we have Mother's Day cards for you, for you people to come down and send cards out to your Mother's Day. And within a couple of hours, every Every single one of those cards was picked up and gone and sent. It worked so well, so they said, well, maybe we should do the same thing for Father's Day. So they called up the card company. They said, hey, let's do the same thing for Father's Day. They agreed. They sent cards for Father's Day. And they said, all right, hey, all of you men, we have cards for you men to send to your Father's Day. And you want to know how many of those men came to get cards for their fathers for Father's Day? Not even one. A study was done on that. And they said that the largest majority, close to 100% of men who are in prison today, had a father that they were angry at, a father that they were rebellious towards, a father that abandoned them, abused them, and wronged them. And they were full of anger. And I suggest to you today that even if your anger doesn't turn to violence, even if your anger doesn't cause you to do something illegal, it is still destructive in your life today. Would you agree with me on that? Unresolved anger is destructive. I want you to consider the consequences, or I want uh, to consider with you the consequences of unresolved anger in these next few minutes that we have together. Number one, unresolved anger distances us from other people. Unresolved anger distances us from other people. When you carry unresolved anger in your life, it distances you from other people. I can ask you to turn in your Bible, please, to Luke chapter 5. Or, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, we'll turn there. This is the story of the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? He had gotten his wealth. He had gotten his inheritance. He had left home. He had gone out in the world and lived and partied and spent it all up. Do you know what his older brother was doing while the younger son was out in the field, out in the world living it up? He was in the field working, doing his job. I have a feeling that he was not probably not only doing his job, but also the job of his brother who was out living it up. I believe that somewhere along the line, this older brother started to get angry about this. That's not fair. He got his inheritance. He's out in the world living it up. Here I am, stuck in the field, working. Well, the story is told in Luke chapter 15. We pick it up in verse 23. Here we have the prodigal son has come home. His dad finds him. Verse 23 says this. Father says, Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He is lost and is found. And they began to be merry. They were excited. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. 
And he said unto him, Thy brother is come. Thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And verse 28 says it all. And he was angry and would not go in. Just stop right there. Full of unresolved anger. He has been doing everything that he was supposed to for all of this time, however long it has been. Getting angry about it. And now this comes and sparks it off. And what's the first thing he does? It says he will not go in. He distances himself from other people. When you get angry, unresolved anger in your life, one of the most common causes is it distances you from relationships in your life. You can't get close to others. It's hard to give and to receive love. For some of you, as I said, it's hard to give and receive love, and you become bottled up with anger in your life. It affects our marriages. It affects our kids. It affects our parenting. It affects our friends. It affects our lives. His name was Terry. I talked to the man who pastored the church. Terry and his wife, Charlotte, were members of the church there. Charlotte was just sweet as sweet could be. One of those good as gold, godly Christian ladies involved in all the ministries, involved in the Sunday school ministry, sang in the church choir, did all of those things. Just a godly lady. But the pastor said he could tell something was wrong because... Sometimes things were a little off. Sometimes Charlotte would come to church weepy. He could see, uh, he could take a look at the boys, and you could see something about the boys as they grew up. They had a couple of boys, they were hyperactive. If you were to look up the word hyperactive in the dictionary, their pictures would be there. I mean, these, these boys were loaded. Charlotte. Some days she would just, uh, you know, you could tell something was wrong. She'd just wipe the tears out of her eyes and keep on going. And the pastor said he sat, day, went down, sat down with her one day and said, Charlotte, what's going on? Charlotte said, just pray for us, preacher. We have a hard time at home. It went on a little while longer, and, and, and the pastor got down, and he's like, Charlotte, you got to talk with me. What's going on? She sat down with him, and she said, Pastor, I don't know what to do. I don't know how much more of this I can take. She said, Terry is physically abusing me. He has ever since we've been married. He is mentally abusing me to the point that I can almost not even be near him. And she said, now the problem is I see its devastating effect on our boys. Terry physically abuses the boys. He beats them into almost an uncontrollable seizure. And the pastor says, can I talk to Terry? And she says, well, you can talk to him, but I'm scared of what's going to happen if he finds out that I talked to you of what, what he's going to do to me as a result. And the pastor said, Charlotte, something's got to happen. I've got to talk to Terry. He watched for Terry. Terry came to church. Terry was an Easter Sunday, Christmas Eve kind of guy. Those were the only two times that Terry came to church. It was coming up close, so the pastor watched for him. Terry came to church. Pastor went and he sat down and started a conversation with Terry. He says, Terry, they tell me that you're a hunter. He says, yeah, preacher, that's why I'm, I'm never in church. I'm always out hunting. The pastor said, I'd love to see your hunting rifles and stuff. Terry uh, lit up like a light bulb, got very excited. I said, come on over to the house. The pastor went on over to his house and Terry took him down in the basement into what was an arsenal that was frightening to look at. Guns. Rifles, shotguns, bows and arrows, homemade knives and things that Terry had made. And, and Terry would start to tell about how he would hunt. And he would talk about these knives that he would use. And he would say that Terry, he, he, he learned how to stalk a deer. So he could, he could creep up on there and stalk a deer. And he could take this knife and he could hunt with that knife. And throw that deer just right. And he could hit that deer just in the par. And, and he would get excited to see he knew what to do and how to do it. To throw that knife just right that he could stop a deer dead in his tracks and drop him right in his tracks. Pastor said, wow, Terry, where did you learn all that? Terry says, in Vietnam. The pastor said, tell me about Vietnam, Terry. You could see the anger start to brew on his face. Terry said, I, I grew up as a farm boy out in Iowa. 
said I was a patriotic teenager if you'd ever seen one. Said the day I turned 18, they didn't have to draft me. I was down there enlisting to the Army as quick as I could. He said I got into the Army and I made my way up and I became a Ranger. He said my job was in the recon and for those of you who don't know what that is, that meant that you had to go out and find the enemy. Terry told the story about how he had held his best friend in all the world dying in his arms and then after that Terry recalls the exact number of how many people he went out and killed that day. Terry said, I was alright preacher. But then they told me that the war was over and I knew we hadn't won yet. He said, they put me onto a plane coming into San Antonio, Texas at the Air Force Base. And I came out expecting what I thought would be a hero's welcome. But instead I came out to protesters, the picket signs, praising the draft dodgers, calling me a warmonger and a baby killer, and signs that said, Jane Fonda for president. Terry said, if I had had my rifle, I would have killed every single one of them in that line that day. Terry said, something happened that day and my life changed forever. And I will never forget what happened on that day. You know, folks, I found that most of the time, the thing that we're angry about, we have a right to be angry about. But now, years later, that anger wasn't destroying all those things, all those people that hurt Terry. It was destroying everybody he loved. It was destroying his wife. It was destroying his family. It was destroying his children. Unresolved anger distances us from people. If you don't resolve that anger, it becomes a poison in your life. And years later, just like in Terry, there's devastating effects that was happening on everyone in his path. Unresolved anger distances from other people. Do you agree? It does. Unresolved anger distances us from other people. Anger moods affect others. When you keep getting hit from anger, from old uh, old wounds that predate your relationship. I mean, it doesn't feel good, does it? When you keep getting hit with anger, and anger is poured out on you because of something that you haven't done, it just doesn't seem right, does it? I could give you an illustration. Uh, say, uh, I took the family out to Red Robin to eat for dinner, and uh, the bill comes, and we get out, everyone gets some burgers and some root beer floats, and the bill comes, and the waitress gives us the bill. And the bill says that it's for $10,000. And I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. How can this be $10,000? This can't be right. And the waitress says, it is. And I say, well, how can this be? All we got was some hamburgers and some milkshakes. And the waitress says, it's because we've decided that we're going to have you pay for everybody who's eaten for the last two days in here. And I say, well, that's not right. And she says, it doesn't matter if it's right. That's a decision that we've made. And that's how people feel, folks. When they have to pay the bill for something they haven't eaten. For they have to pay the bill for anger that they haven't caused. And that unresolved anger distances us. And they want to get away from you. And they don't want to be around you. And they don't want to be there to have something keep being poured upon them. You make your spouse and everyone else pay for it. It's one of the reasons that second marriages don't work and third marriages don't work, where you were angry and got out of the first marriage and fell, and first marriage and fell in love again and said, it'll work this time, but that marriage falls apart and the next one falls apart and the kids fall apart. Why does it happen? Because you haven't dealt with your anger. Unresolved anger distances us from people. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24, the Word of God says, Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, thou shalt not go. You know, the Bible knows what it's talking about, doesn't it? Young ladies, you out there listening to me, if you date a guy and you see a vile, bad temper in him, one of the smartest and wisest things you can do is to get away from that man. Because as you get together, that angry, bad temper that's consuming him, that'll consume you too. 
That bad temper will ruin your life too. Unresolved anger distances us from other people, and the Lord said, stay away from it. Secondly, unresolved anger distances us from God. Back to our Ephesians chapter 4 passage. It basically says, if you're going to be angry, don't sin. And if you sin, you give in place to the devil. And what does the Bible say in Psalm 66 verse 18? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not, what? hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. When I carry anger in my heart, and that it becomes sin at that point, and that sin in my life makes it so that I cannot have a proper relationship with God. I could give you an Old Testament character illustration. Uh, I'll tell you about Moses. Moses was angry at the children of Israel. I'll have you turn with your Bibles, please, back to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, Moses is angry at the children of Israel. I mean, they just, they were complainers. They were backbiters. I mean, all they did was whine and complain. Complain about the food. Complain about the drink. Complain, complain, complain. At this particular day, they're complaining that they're thirsty. And Moses, in his unresolved anger, does something that he's not supposed to do. We pick up the story. Verses 7 through 12 of chapter 20. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather about the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. God's going to make water come out of a rock, a miracle. And thou shalt forth, um, bring forth to them water out of the rock, so shalt thou give to the congregation, and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded them. And see what he does. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation to them. And Moses says unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we now fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And it says, the Lord spake unto Moses, says, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Moses, in his unresolved anger for the children of Israel, rather than looking at that with faith, rather than looking for that miracle, he basically says, See you all stupid complaining people! You just complain so much here I'm supposed to give water on this dumb old rock! And he hits that rock twice. And because of that, God says he is not allowed to go into the promised land. Unresolved anger distances us from God. I'll call her name Mary. It was certainly not her name. It was actually Mary's husband. The pastor had met him, invited him to church. He came several times, and then Mary came. She came sporadically. One day she was in a conversation with the pastor of the church, and, and she said to him, I'd like to come in for a counseling session. He said, okay. Mary came in for a counseling session. And he was, she was the type of person, you could just see bitter rage on her face. Someone who might be very attractive, but she was just consumed with rage. She sat down with the pastor, they began to talk, and she said, I don't know if you've noticed, but I am an angry woman. He said, I didn't want to tell her all that I was thinking. He said, really? She said, yes, I am an angry woman. He said, do you want to deal with it? She said, I'm not sure if I want to deal with it. I just want to tell you why I'm angry. The pastor says, have at it. Mary says, I am angry at my husband. I am angry at my previous two husbands. I am angry at you because you are a man. I am angry at all men. And because... The Bible describes God as a father. I am angry at God, and I can't stand it. The pastor says, really? She says, yeah. The pastor says, you have a problem with men. She said, yeah. She said, let me tell you why I have a problem with men. She said, my dad visits your church. My dad visits all the churches in town. He's got money, drops it in the offering plate, and all the pastors kind of bow to him. They think that he's some sugar daddy kind of Christian man. But that's the man that ever since I was four years old raped me every single night of my life. Taking advantage of me, incestuously raping me night after night after night. And I am angry. 
I heard the story, actually this one was me in person. My best friend when I was in the Navy, his name was Dan, his wife was named Vanessa. I invited Dan to church. I went to a church off base at the time. Dan was raised Roman Catholic. He came to church with me. He made a profession of faith. And I start to get to know him and his wife quite well. I went over to see them uh, often, and one day um, uh, Dan's wife, Vanessa, and I were getting into a discussion. I was trying to witness to her. Dan, as I said, was raised Roman Catholic. Vanessa was a practicing witch. She followed Wicca. And we began talking and began witnessing to her. And she began to tell me her story. Vanessa said that when she was a little girl, probably about six or seven years old, her dad was a hunter. He would always go out hunting with his brothers. She always wanted him to go. Finally, one day, he says, Would you like to come out hunting with us? She was all excited. She had no idea what it was like. She was all excited. She wanted to go out hunting. Well, the kind of tail they were hunting for that day was not white-tailed deer. They got Vanessa out into the woods, him and his three brothers. Dad went first. Raped Vanessa in the back seat of the car, of the truck. And then after he was done, then one of his brothers came in, and then after that, the next brother, and then after that, the next brother. Vanessa said that got to be a regular occurrence from the time, however old she was when she told me, six or seven years old, all the way up into her teenage years. Her dad would take her out hunting with them, and the brothers would all take turns with her. And sometimes they'd leave her in the truck and go out hunting, and sometimes they'd come back in at night and they'd take turns with her again. Until finally she was just so consumed with anger, she finally ran away from home. Here she is. She hates men. She hated her husband. The day that they got married, they had a huge blow up in the parking lot right outside of the chapel. She ended up chucking her wedding band out in the parking lot. It took them forever to find it. They would fight violently and bitterly. The, 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 the smallest thing would set her off. She hated me. She hated men. And we began to talk and she would say that she hated Jesus because he was a man and because God is described as, as a father. She hates God and there was no way she could ever have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen. I heard that story and I wanted to say, tell me who these men are and I'll go have them killed. And that's the truth. That's how I felt. I believe that a man who will do that doesn't deserve a chance. Did these girls I just tell you about have a right to be angry? Absolutely. But because of what that anger was doing, their anger was destroying their relationships, and now neither of them have any relationship with God because they hate God. Unresolved anger distances us from God. I want to tell you this morning that while both of these women had a right to be angry, that unresolved anger in their lives wasn't hurting the men that hurt them. It was destroying them. And for each of them is destroying her and everything in her path, her life. And if you don't learn to deal with your anger, it will distance you from God and you will not be able to have a relationship. We've got to deal with it, folks. You've got to deal with it. Ladies, years of unresolved anger. Like these people, I left them cursing God and man. They lost their spiritual insight. They lost their spiritual joy. Their lives were at a dead end. Unresolved anger distances us ourselves from God. We need to deal with it. And lastly, number three, unresolved anger distances us from ourself. You know, when you carry anger in your life, you're, you become someone that you're not normally. When you carry anger, you, you become some, someone that you're not Remember those ads that were on a few years ago for the Snickers bar? And they would say that when you're hungry, you're, you're angry. And you're hangry, actually, they would say. And you're not yourself. And you'll be angry. And then you get that Snickers and you calm down. Well, it's kind of like that. But that angry, it's not because you're hungry. It's just that anger. And you're not yourself with your angry. It's like a Jekyll and Hyde. Someone comes along. You could be in a great mood. All of a sudden, someone something flips that switch. At one moment, they're happy. And the next one, they become someone you couldn't even imagine they would become. I can give you an illustration in the Bible. Judas. Judas Iscariot. We turn to Luke chapter 12 to see the story. Judas was one of the 12 disciples, yes? I mean, he was, wasn't he? This isn't a trick question. He was one of the 12. 
There has to be a reason why Jesus chose Judas, or he would not have chosen him. But somewhere along the line, as we seem to be reading the Gospels and see the story, it appears that Judas has, seems to have some kind of a problem with money. He has to find a way that he can become the treasurer of the disciples and, and carry the bag. And in this particular occasion, Luke chapter 12, we find that there is a woman who comes and has some ointment and she anoints Jesus' feet. She breaks the box over it and she anoints Jesus' feet. And if you watch it, Judas, he gets up tight. And he says, he makes the excuse, we could have taken this money and given it to the poor. Jesus lectures him. Similar situation in Mark chapter 14. This time, uh, the anointment is being anointed on Jesus' head. And Judas, along with the other disciples, sees it. And he gets up tight. And Jesus says to him, says to him let her alone. She hath wrought a good work on me. You know what the Bible says? It says, from that day after that, Judas looked for a way to betray Jesus Christ, the Son of God. From that day forward, and by the way, do any of you remember or know what Judas betrayed Jesus for? What was it? It was 30 pieces of silver, but money. He betrayed him for money. From that day forward... Judas became someone and he was not. You know, this was not the normal Judas that has been with the Lord for the past several years. This is a Judas full of unresolved anger. Something happened. He was upset about money and it turned to unresolved anger in his life. And as a result of it, he had to betray the Son of God. Unresolved anger distances us from ourselves. Judas was not the same way. I could give you uh, an illustration of a man. I'm, I'm just going to say his name differently to protect the guilty. I'm going to call him Jerry. Jerry was a friend of mine. But every time you would get around Jerry, the slightest thing would set him off, and he would just completely become something that he was not. I remember he had there was a disagreement between one of his kids and one of our kids, and, and I was gone uh, working at the time. I was doing snow plowing removal, and I was um, out in Elmira where we live in Bath, and my wife was up here with the kids alone, and 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 Jerry comes up, and he's like storming around our house, and you could hear him out there yelling at the house in the middle of the night. My wife called me; she was worried by the time I get home he had left shortly thereafter that we uh, we came home we were out and we came home we found footsteps around the house and a rock thrown through the window of our living room and we don't know who who uh, who for sure did it but we live in the middle of nowhere and we're friends with everybody pretty sure that it was jerry who did this to us he became someone he was not because of unresolved anger. And there was um, some things about unresolved anger in his life that I will address a little bit later. But I want to say to you, as we close this service today, unresolved anger. First, it distances us from other people. Secondly, it distances us from God. It distances us from who we are. It distances us from maturing. When you have unresolved anger in our life, you know, when you have unresolved anger, you never mature emotionally. You never mature spiritually. You never mature into the person who God intends for you to be. That's why someone with unresolved anger, they blow up and they act like, and they say things like a 12-year-old kid would say. They blow up and they act and do things that a six-year-old kid would do when they're consumed with anger. Why is that? Because they never grew up. Let me give you some scripture and I'll close. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. I didn't say it. The Lord said it. An angry person is a foolish person. Proverbs chapter 15 and verses 17 and 18. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox where hatred is therewith. A wrathful, and, uh, a wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. It basically says it is better for you to be lonely and, and live off the herbs of the land than to have your own cattle and your own beef and your own wealth and to be so full of anger. 
I'm not just getting after you men, and also let me get after you ladies a little bit too. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9. It is better to dwell on the corner of a housetop than with a brawling wife and a wide house. Uh, one of the newer versions of the King James phrase is this. It is better to dwell on the roof of a housetop than with an angry and contentious woman. Listen. Unresolved anger is a problem, and it needs to be taken care of. We need to get rid of it. We need to get rid of it. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 17. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse, 30, uh, verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 4. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. I'm closing right here. You say, Pastor, you haven't told us what to do about it. Well, here's the beginning right now. Today is the day to admit that you have unresolved anger. If you go to those AA meetings, if you've ever been to one or you know someone who has, they'll tell you that the hardest step is admitting that you have a problem. When I get up there and say, Hi, my name is Scott Spencer and I'm an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic, by the way. But the hardest problem, they say, is making that first step. Well, I don't know if it is the hardest problem, but it is a big one admitting that you have a problem with unresolved anger. By the way, the same is true for you with sin in your life. If you do not admit that you have sin in your life, you can never come to Jesus and have Him as your Savior. If you come to Jesus and you cannot fess up to the fact that you have sin in your life and that you are having sin and living in sin in your life, you can't be saved. You cannot have Him as your Savior while you continue to live in sin and try to justify why it's okay. Some of you listening today when we're talking about anger, you need to come to the point where you will say, I am one of those people who has unresolved anger in my life. And you need to do that. And I need to do that. I need to admit it. I want to get rid of it. You need to get to the point where you are willing to do something about it. I said at the beginning of this sermon that the number one enemy of love was unresolved anger. Some of you dads listening online, you are ruining your family, Dad. You are ruining your family, and you are making a big mistake not to deal with this today. Some of you ladies listening, you're raging. You are full of rage. You are full of angry, angry at people, angry at God. Hey, you very well might have a reason, a justified reason, why you're angry. But you've got to deal with it. You've got to finish it. Let's not let the sun go down upon our wrath. Let's not give place to the devil. Hey, this is the day for reckoning. This is the day for reconciliation. Back to our beginning verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, Forgiving one another. Forgiving one another. Forgiving. Forgiving. Say it out loud, forgiving one another. Say it out loud, forgiving one another. Say it out loud, forgiving one another. Now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, no one looking around, Everyone listening to me online, heads bowed and eyes closed. I want you to think of that person today that you are so angry against. That person that you are angry towards. For some of you listening, the very thought of them brings tears to your eyes, makes you clench your fist and grit your teeth. Could you say, forgiving one another? Forgiving one another. Could we say it out loud again? Forgiving one another? Could you say it? Forgiving one another? Say it out loud. Forgiving one another? Lady, he trespassed against you. He did you wrong. He wronged you. Quit carrying anger. Can you say it with me? Forgiving one another? Yeah. 
Say it with me. Forgiving one another. Say it again. Forgiving one another. Sir, maybe your dad sprayed so much anger upon you that you have been destroying everyone in your path and taking it out and your wife and kids. Why would you want to do that to the people that love you? Why would you want to harbor that anger in your life? Could you say it one more time? Forgiving one another. Could you say it? Forgiving one another. Say it out loud. Forgiving one another. Forgiving one another. Now next week, I am going to share with you the principles of how to unload the anger. Come back and join us for church next week and I will share with you what I believe the Bible says on how you can unload and release that anger and get victory on anger in your life. But this morning, it's the willingness to say, I have a problem, I am angry, and I want to resolve it. I already asked you once with everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed. I'm going to ask for it again. Again, one more time. Everybody's head head bowed and your eyes closed. We've been dealing a lot with anger this morning and unresolved anger in people's lives. How many of you would say to me, Pastor Scott Spencer, I have a problem with anger in my life. Just hearing the illustrations and things that you have told me today, I have a problem with anger in my life. Would any of you by your hand raised say, Pastor Scott, I have a problem and I would like to pray for you. Is there anyone like that here today? Perhaps some of you people out there listening online, perhaps you don't want to raise your hand because you don't want your family or friends or whoever else might be around. You don't want them to see. But would you be able to at least say, to you know, if you were to be here with me today, say, I have a problem with unresolved anger? We talked, I briefly mentioned it, upon how if you do not come to the Lord Jesus and, and admit that you are a sinner, that you cannot be saved, this wasn't necessarily a message on salvation, but that is a very important thing. Maybe that anger has turned to sin in your life, and that anger, that unresolved anger, that sin in your life is distancing you, distancing you from God, just like those ladies that I had mentioned earlier. Maybe you have a hatred of God because of unresolved anger that has been sprayed upon you today would you say Pastor Scott I want victory in this would you say Pastor Scott I need a savior I am a sinner God can save you today I'm going to say a prayer although this wasn't a message on salvation but I'm going to give you the chance to get saved if you've been convicted about things in your life and you would like to be saved then pray this prayer with me Lord Jesus I am a sinner I admit, acknowledge today, maybe it's anger I have in my life, maybe some other secret sin that I'm hiding, but I'm convicted about it, and you brought it to my attention, and I am a sinner, and I want to get saved. Lord Jesus, please, I confess my sin unto you. And people, you have to confess it, you have to fess up to it, just like with unresolved anger. You have to fess up to it, or you can't be saved. Admit to it, if you have sin in your life, confess that sin. I confess my sins unto you. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And folks, folks, I've talked to you before about repentance. Repentance is where you have to turn from that sin. You have that sin in your life. Maybe that unresolved anger. Maybe that sin from anger. Or maybe some other sin and you've got that sin in your life. You cannot be saved as long as that sin is in your life. You have to repent of it. You have to put it under the blood. Ask Jesus to save you today. Repent of your sin today. Confess that sin. Get that right. And if you do, you can be saved today. Friends, unresolved anger will destroy your life. Don't let it do that. Next week, our service, we're going to be dealing with this anger. Come back next week. Learn the principles on how to unload that anger. Learn those principles so you can have victory in that anger today. I thank you for being with us for church today, for joining us at the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship. I pray that God may bless you as you go on your way, and I hope to see you next time. Take care, and God bless.